Hello, Bedhead. Welcome to Outlandish Outlander, episode S03E12, otherwise known as the penultimate episode right. of season three. Use that for, SAT word. For those of you that don't know, we are slam poets when we're not doing this in our poetry slam. We announce the penultimate poet. That should never ever be done in the real world. Uh, I don't know don't why use not. the word penultimate. I don't know why you always say that. Uh, don't we want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is about how this episode was all the Huey Lewis homage? Okay, that's as good a place as any to start. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, because, of course, one of many, the brilliant Huey Lewis of Huey Lewis in the News, one of his brilliant songs was his song, Back in Time, for... Uh, well, yeah. For Back to the Future Part well, 2, I thought you... time travel thing. So, of course, they, they should have gotten him to do Back for Time <laughs> for for this episode, just a little tweaking. J yeah, j j j j I j don't... J we are back for time. I, uh, I don't think that's what the back means, but that's a good guess. So, that, yeah. That's that would be funny if that is what the back meant that it was so, back and forth in time, but I don't think so. I'm sure. I it up. I'm sure they were heavy in negotiations with Huey Lewis for the reboot of yeah. Back for Time. Uh, I looked it up. The Bakra means boss, but specifically on a slave plantation. So you think they should have got Bar Baron McCrary to work with uh, Huey Lewis? Yes. Who, whoever that is. Did you notice? I don't really talk about the music much. Actually, I'll give a little shout out to Outlander Pod. Ginger at, on um, Outlander Pod. It was a music major in college, and she's always coming up with all kinds of details about the musical themes. She'll be like, oh, did you notice, like, the flutes or the oboe or whatever in the theme that refers to Willie? Like, did you notice that this theme came back or that theme came back? I mean, she's always really attuned to every little nuance they're making with the music. But I did notice... Um, and maybe she's encouraged me to listen for it, that when you saw Galus, uh, the, the, some of the music they were using when she would appear is the music that they tend to play at the Stones, I think. A uh, Stones concert? <laughs> no, the Stones you travel through. <laughs> Ba 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 Because she can't get no satisfaction. Okay, so it starts with a long, cold open that gives you some of the details of what young Ian went through. And I liked that. Um, they've done similar things many times in the TV show where incidents you only heard about later when they were recounted in exposition style to Claire as the, you know, the main sort of POV, you know, so she gets told a story or she and Jamie get told a story. So, so basically they show you. And I, I liked that, um, that they did that backtrack and showed young Ian get to, uh, get to Galus. So Galus is there, she's got young Ian she doesn't kill him for two reasons. He's not a virgin anyway, and also she finds out that he's related to Jamie, and she finds out that Jamie might have the sapphire on him and she needs the sapphires. You sort of wonder, you know, uh, yeah, if it's really goat's blood. And also, like, isn't there only about two pints of blood in your body? How many goats would they have to slaughter for her to have a whole bathtub full of blood? See, it takes far fewer humans. It's more efficient. No, I, I'm saying that two liters of blood is not very much to fill up a whole bathtub. A whole bathtub must have about at least, I don't know, 10 gallons in it or something. 
she's going to work on the spreadsheet right now and she'll uh, insert the power. Yeah, how many goats needing the sapphires for the prophecy? I mean, they've sort of changed that thread with the Campbells and the prophecy and so much from the book that it's that it's, I could not even go into all the ways it's in, in 15 minutes that that is changed from how it is in the book, but I think it's for the better. I personally like the way they're streamlining that and sort of punching up the connections. I thought it was it was good because even knowing the book, I was sort of like waiting to see, oh my gosh, what are they gonna do with this episode? Because there's so many things that have to be covered between now and the finale and some things that I'm hoping they'll leave out, uh, both because I'm squeamish and just because I don't think they're necessary or because they're even a little offensive. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of waiting excitedly to see and and I liked this episode we say we're 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 not spoiler free so I might as well say in the book there's a bunch of voodoo stuff and almost nothing creeps me out as much as voodoo kind of stuff do not watch American Horror Story season three or four if you don't like or, voodoo. or whatever the New Orleans one was don't yeah in the book especially Galus has sort of dived head first into crazy town um and and she's embraced this whole idea that prophecies and fortune tellers and voodoo etc can all be of help to her to try and find out she's more determined than ever to find out if she didn't stop the the scottish culture from being destroyed in the past then maybe this prophecy can help her go back to the future and and you know scotland will rise again then so so she's sort of trying to play all angles here. The prophecy in the book is merely something like um, the last remaining heir, the, the, the last heir of the Mackenzies is going to rise to power. So it's more of a prophecy that if she can just find the last heir of the Mackenzies, that, that she will figure out, you know, how they, how, how Scotland can rise again. Not that she's got to kill that person. That raises the stakes and the justifiable nature of actions taken against her. Let's just put it that way. Wow. Yeah, as we said, we're not spoiler free in any way, shape or form. So you shouldn't be watching this if you don't want hints about the books, about next week, everything, so. They get to Jamaica, um, and there is, uh, they, they, they're, you know, thinking they need to search the town, and they think they have to go to the slave market, because they say that he might have been sold in the slave market. That's gone into in much more grisly, um, rated X and potential, and very gruesome details in the book. Um, I felt like it, I'm sure there must have been many conversations in the writer's room to make sure they were going to deal with that material appropriately. And I felt like it was dealt with pretty well. Did you feel, how did you feel about the slave market and all that stuff that happens? I prefer it when there is no slave market. Well, yeah. I mean, you couldn't really cut it out entirely, I don't think, since they have to go look for Ian. So yeah, in the slave market, this is pretty much exactly how it happens in the book. Jamie ends up buying a guy who's being, um, you know, sexually abused by the seller to prove his virility. He's someone who is otherwise unsaleable because he only has one arm, I think is the issue in the book here. They took a much easier tactic of having him be a lame, be lame so that the actor can limp rather than have to have an arm, you know, taken out in post-production or whatever. Um, so Claire, that's finally what puts Claire over the edge um, and she causes a scene and uh, Jamie buys the slave and she's like, what in the world? And he's like, well, you told me to do something 
uh, how else do you think I might stop what was going on except to simply buy the slave? You know, this is, we're outnumbered. Uh, this is what's happening now. And, and I think they do have a conversation in the book about the fact that slavery will end and when's it going to end. And they do decide that they're probably going to let the slave go. I don't remember if they find out that it's Lord John before they go to the ball in the book. They may, and Jamie may specifically think that Lord John can help him because he knows Lord John and he finds out it's Lord John. I mean, I thought it was really interesting that they showed that, that Lord John had made the sapphire into something that he clearly keeps on him all the time to remind him of Jamie. Because he's in love. Yeah. Um, in the book, I mean, you can see that Claire senses some chemistry between him and Jamie that she's a little suspicious of. In the book, she's very, very much more suspicious of it. And even though she and Lord John sort of start to like each other, then they decide again that they don't really like each other because they're too jealous of each other. So I'm thinking that maybe they're going to soft pedal that a little more in the show than they do in the book. And I was very intrigued by how they were dealing with the issue of E10 show. Um, first of all, it's interesting that now that they're not in Scotland, where supposedly his name means something rude in Gaelic, that instead of calling him Mr. Willoughby, Jamie does introduce him to the ladies as E10 show. And they are clearly fascinated with him in a very condescending kind of way. And I, I think that what they're trying to show is that even though Jamie and Claire and and their party are treating Yi Chen Cho rather nicely, that it is true that in the 18th century, he would have been seen as an exotic, um, lesser sort of person. And then he's drawn to Margaret, and I don't remember that being any part of anything in the book, but I was very intrigued that they were sort of putting Yi Chen Cho and Margaret together, like each one could see the other was special. Um, Margaret, you know, sees through to the truth of people, like she was, you know, giving a prophecy to the slave that he would be free one day, and her brother ripped her off and said, why do you keep giving fortunes to people that won't pay me? So. Why? Why? Because she's the real deal. I don't, and I think, in the book, she is also, turns out, in a very gruesome way to be the real deal, which I'm hoping they're not going to show us. But I don't think in the book there's, like, her brother, that's just not a part of it. There's a whole different storyline with, with her and her brother in the book that does not involve him knowing that she's a seer. There's a whole end to the E. Tian Cho storyline in the book where they can't possibly be going because unless they're going to insert something drastically at the last minute, there's a whole plot line they've thankfully left out that is kind of how things end up with E.T. and Cho 2. And since they've left that plot line out, I have no idea how they're going to end the plot line with E.T. and Cho, but they're maybe hinting at it this week when he gets together with Margaret. So there you have it. Tune in next week to see how all the plot lines for season three are tied up when we will re be reporting, well, actually, we'll be reporting pre-Providence, but then we will report more from yeah. the Providence party of... Oh, that's true. Mary we Blake. did... We have to watch the episode at midnight. We should probably try to record right then. You should probably try to stay awake and we should probably try to record right then. Because somehow I have to edit the episode, get it ready, and then we have to get on the road and drive four hours. I'm Little hungry, phrase. so why Here haven't you, you turned this off yet? I'm hungry. All right, this, th this is a close-up of a finger going to the iPhone X off button. Right, 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 right.
right, right.